We continue today the study of uh, First Peter, so I would invite you there. Uh, open your Bibles with uh, First Peter chapter one. We're going to read first the text, and then we will dive in into detailed, uh, as much as we can, uh, detailed um, study of this beautiful, wonderful passage. So we are going to go back to uh, chapter 1, verse 17 through 21. Open your Bibles, and we are going to read this text together. I would like to ask you to stand with me uh, in reverence to the Word of God. I would like us to express our uh, serious approach, the text of Scripture that we're going to read, intended to change us, intended to change something. So prayerfully, as you read, I would like you to uh, think already about the truths that are here. Verse 17, we're reading together. If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Let's pray together. Father, we are thrilled. We are always in awe how much you have done for us. We were ungodly. We were following our own lusts, we were not even willing to be saved. And we didn't know how if we were willing. But your mercy and your grace was shown through your son. And now we read this text. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would work in our hearts in such a way that truths that are here would become ours and would feed our faith so our hope and faith be in you alone. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. You all, I suppose, once, at least once in life, sailed in a boat with oars attached to the sides of the boat. Those who love jet skis only, probably you don't know what is that, but a little bit older of us, uh, part of this congregation, we, we know what is that. Um, for those who don't know, those are just long poles with uh, flat blades at the end of the pole. It could be wooden, could be plastic, but um, we use those wooden plastic poles with a flat blade to row or steer a boat through the waters. If so, if you have ever sailed that kind of boat, you are familiar with that moment when you are rowing with just one oar. The boat begins to spin and circle in one place and basically is incapable of moving forward. In order to normalize the movement of the boat in the desired direction, you need to use two of those poles simultaneously at the same time. Or one oar evenly on one side and then the other. If you just use one side, it will be spinning to the right. If you will use only this side, it will be spinning to the left. And you basically will be uh, in one spot circling, unless you like this uh, dizzy effect on yourself, you probably will like it, but it's not going to uh, help you for a long time. Many Christians fall into one extreme or the other. They row 
with one or of the imputed righteousness of Christ. They love to talk about grace. They boast about grace in Christ. They uh, sing hallelujah to Christ. They study scripture. They uh, sing of his forgiveness and justification. They claim to be happy in God. But if you ask them honestly and have this open conversation, very often they and others around them wonder why their character and life has changed a little if changed at all. There is no joy of salvation about which so much is said in scripture and little enthusiasm in serving others in the lives of those people. So they know grace and they just use one or. And suddenly or very soon you see that their life is just spinning around in one spot, moving nowhere. Years later, they are found in the same spot, circling, boasting about grace. There's the other extreme. There's other extreme. There are people who row with the oar of, I call them, roar, oar of sanctification, not roar, <laughs> oar of sanctification, and try their best to move forward on their own. They know that they need to be holy, and they try to be holy, holy, holy. I need to be holy. And their boat of life uh, spinning around in the other direction, and actually they are not moving also anywhere. They are just spinning and standing in one place, making dizzy themselves, um, dizzy and others around them. And if you talk to those people, they're filled with inner deep disappointment, boredom, and burning out, and eventually even falling out of the process due to the dominating bitterness, anger, jealousy, self-righteousness, whatever you name it. So imagine that picture. In our lives, it happens to almost all of us. One time we hear a grace of God when we are just gracing and gracing with one or. And then we hear, be holy, be holy. The problem is that we need to understand the two oars need to be used at the same time. Or if you're kayaking, you're probably one here and one here. If you don't do this, one here and one here, you will basically get stuck in one place and move nowhere in your spiritual life. So in order for us to uh, escape these moments or have them less and less in our lives, Scripture is given to us in such a way. And First Peter is just an amazing book because it shows us how to use those two pedals, okay? How to use those two oars in lives. And if you're carefully following Peter in his letter, you will see he does exactly the same thing. He starts his epistle with, you were elected to salvation. You were uh, bought by the blood of Christ. You were graced with his mercy, uh, with justification, with righteousness. And soon after that, he is moving like, be holy. And after saying, be holy and spend your life as a, every turn, every turn you make in your life, uh, make them in the fear of the Lord, right away he says, knowing. And if you look carefully at the text we just read, I would like you to look at this. We'll see this main idea in the text. These two words, basically the whole passage from 17 to 21 is hanging on these two words. The main idea of this passage, conduct yourself in fear by knowing or because you know. It's very, it's very important that we notice this. It's a very simple observation. But without this observation, you will lose the whole point. So he's talking about grace that 
transforms us and that saves us and suddenly he switches to another or of sanctification says be holy and as soon as he says be holy and and every turn make it uh, in the fear of the Lord right away he says knowing that you were redeemed that's a beautiful picture and balanced Christian life you cannot just talk about grace without experiencing change, real change in your life. Or if you want to have real change, you don't just self-discipline yourself to death. Like Luther, once he understood that he had fear of God and fear of the Lord started in, in such a way experienced in his life that he wanted to confess. He confessed every single thought, every single moment, every single second. And then he was trying to do all kinds of rituals. And then he, then he went uh, uh, into pilgrimage to Rome. And then he did this and that. Why? He wanted to live in the fear of the Lord, but it killed him to the point that he realized it is the righteousness of God that is given to me. And as soon as he understood the gospel and grace, he said, I was ready to stand on my head out of joy. The passage in Romans 1, 16 through 18 or 17 uh, was basically the, he said, gate of paradise opened before me. When I realized imputed righteousness, holiness of God. And then he said, out of that was born my Christian life that was pleasing to God. Peter is helping us exactly in this regard. For those who were not here last time, I will go just a little bit and will tell you about this. Now, it's very important for us to realize, and this is what Peter wants us to understand. Like in this passage, just a few days ago, I'm reading and I'm like, it's unbelievable. It's like in every phrase, there's a lot of teaching, a lot of doctrines, a lot, lot of theology, theology of sanctification, theology of righteousness, theology of, uh, of imputation, theology of God, who God is. And then we talk about faith. And when we hear about all different things, you, and as you go there, you will see uh, things about, uh, taught about sin and, and man and uh, how, how man needs to be saved in all kinds of theology, okay? Theology, it's a doctrine or teaching of Scripture, the truth that is revealed to us in the Scripture. Listen carefully. The theology rightly understood in the Scripture, from the Scripture, will drive our doxology. Doxology is when I'm praising God. We have every reason to praise God. But guess what? It does not end there. Your doxology, praising God, will always express itself in action. Always. So we talked about fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is theology. It believes that I draw from Scripture. They drive my delights. They determine, they cause my heart to delight in God. And as soon as I delight in God, I want to serve Him. Serve Him in the capacity where I live, in the place where I live, in the capacity He has given me. It is all put together, three of those. They cause your heart to fear the Lord. This is what fear of God is. And we spoke about this, we talked about this last time. Just wanted to kind of go back and remind you where we ended up. You may read this in verse 17 again. If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, that's theology. Our God is the father, heavenly father. A lot of things we can draw from here. Number two, this God who is the father, he judges the sin. Many churches today avoid talking about sin or God who judges. And they say, oh, you know, it's Old Testament, God of judgment. He is there in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it is God of mercy. Not, not, not at all. In the Old Testament, God is God of mercy. And in the Old Testament, God who judges sin. And in the New Testament, we talk about Christ not only as a meek and humble uh, who went to the cross, but a powerful, almighty king who will judge the earth. 
And his feet will be in the blood of his enemies. We hear Christ who is very, very presented in a clear way as a judge of all sins. So he moves on. Peter says, conduct yourself in fear during the time of your stay. The time of your stay is given by God. And then he says, knowing that you were not redeemed with the perishable things. And he moves to doxology. In fact, uh, it is proven uh, based on theologians and historians who study this text. They say that this text from 18 to 21 is a hymn. Church was singing this. So Peter is basically almost quoting the Christian faith and credo or Christian uh, faith at, as, as is in Christ. He is basically reiterating here in this text that is praising Christ, praising Christ. And he says, look, you can conduct yourself only when you know. By the way, I wanted to stop here as well for a second. Because I think, I think we forget we forget the connection between knowing and doing. Your doing is always the result of your knowing. Anything that you know about God will determine what you are doing. And sometimes we don't know what you know. You don't know what I know about God. But when you look at my life, you will basically should, should come to the idea he believes in this kind of God. Because being holy, it is basically reflecting God's character. Sometimes we think the holy is a, is a, is a pope in, 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 in all the big robes and uh, uh, maybe priests, uh, they are holy. Or uh, those who are just in monasteries, they are holy because they, they separated themselves. Not at all. The Bible does not speak about this at all. Well, the Bible says that we need to be holy. We are holy. God is holy. He demands holiness. And he says no one can be holy unless the holiness of Christ is given to you. And when it is that happening, when is that happening, you will be holy. So holiness, I would like to remind us all, we spoke about this last time, with the fear of God, living in the fear of God, being holy, it is a knowledge of God that awakens a deep reverence for God and is expressed in humble submission to God and active. It is active reflection of his character in all areas of my life. To live in the fear of God. I had one person come, come, come into me after that and say like, oh, come on, come on. We, we're already scared to death. Why, still, why do we need still to live in the fear? <laughs> If you listen carefully, to live in the fear of God is the freedom. That it, it's amazing freedom that every believer is supposed to experience. It is freedom from fear of men, fear of the future. But live in the fear of God is a knowledge. It starts with a knowledge of God that we learn from Scripture, not my own doing. We, it comes from Scripture. It awakens a deep reverence. Adoration, deep reverence for God, and it will be always expressed in humble submission to God. And I think it's very important. We have here in this, can you put this? Uh, do we have that uh, definition there? I wanted to make sure that you uh, hear this definition. Oh, it's not there. It's not there, okay. Uh, then listen carefully again. It is the knowledge of God that causes my heart to be reverent in his presence, to understand that he is present everywhere. And then in his presence, we want to, in his presence, we want uh, to really um, do what he wants us to do, basically reflecting his image in us. So let me, let me, just one more thing here. It's very important. Fear of God is not only running from sin. Fear of God is active reflection of his image in my work, in my family, in my business, in my money management, in my time. I'm reflecting, and believe me, a holy person does maximum of it. Holy person who reflects God's character, 
It's not some kind of a reverence that we experienced only here during the church. People call it encountering God. No, it's living in the presence of God, meaning using all the resources He gave you. Your gifts, your talents, your, your skills, your knowledge, your, your abilities that you have, your money, your business. You use all of it to the maximum for God's glory. All of it. In fact, people who are holy, they understand who their God is and they understand this is His world. I'm in my Father's world. Yes, it's broken, but it is my Father's world. And what He gave me, I want to use to Him. For his glory. So that's the main point of this passage. Peter is saying, okay, be holy. Spend your time in fear of the Lord. And he says, you can do this only because you know. Only because you know. That's the main passage uh, point. So what Peter wants us to think about. What he wants us to know. What he wants us to bear in our mind. As we walk slowly in our life, or maybe fast, any speed you have in your life, anything that you do, remember in every turn, you be holy at every turn. We are going to look at this passage, uh, and specifically at three questions about redemption. We're going to answer three questions. What, how, and why? Those are basic three questions we need to always ask about any text, about any situation, about ourselves, about people, about anything that we hear. What, how, and why? So we're going to look at first question. It is, what are we redeemed from? Or what are believers in Christ redeemed from? What they are redeemed from. I remember I read a book uh, by R.C. Sproul. It's called Saved from What? He starts that book, actually he wrote that book because of one conversation it happened to have in a parking lot. Um, a fellow approached him with a question, are you saved? Sir, are you saved? And R.C. stopped, uh, R.C. Sproul, looked at him and asked, saved from what? It's a good question. We often assume that people know what we mean by the question, but uh, he is asking, Saved from what? The guy was somewhat lost and confused with backfired question. R.C. later wrote this book, Saved from What? To show Christians that the essence of salvation is to be saved from the holy and just and escapable wrath of God, first of all. First, what we need to understand, saved from the wrath of God. And the only way to be saved from wrathful, holy God is by running to God who is willing to show his mercy and forgive. And that's the paradox of Christian faith. We hear about God who is judging every sin, yet to run from judgment of this God is impossible. And the best way is to turn around and to just jump into his his um, surrounding grace and mercy. We often talk about salvation in general ways. And that's why I think we often lose our grips with the gospel. I, I, just, wanted to, I just wanted to maybe uh, bring some examples how people uh, usually talk about this. And those are right questions. If I would ask you what God saved you from, what he redeemed you from, we would say, God saved me from sin, from its punishment, from its power, its pleasure. And one day he will save us from the presence of sin. I can't wait for that. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of my own sin. That here and there, they just pop up again uh, in all kinds of ways. But one day, God will save us from the presence of sin. We know that God saved us from hell. From eternal punishment. He saved us from the devil, from the world, from, the, from death. God saved us from ourselves. He saved us from our own lustful desires. From the meaning of sin in our lives. So Peter is saying we are redeemed or ransomed. And right away he reminds us who we are. 
He says, you were slaves who needed to be freed. Look with me at this passage again. Conduct yourself in the fear during the time of your stay. Verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed. The word redeemed is basically pointing back to a slavery. It, it's an important word in the Bible. So please try to listen carefully. It's very important term and doctrine and teaching of the, of the Bible as far as our salvation. In Exodus 6.6, 6, we read that God redeemed his people from slavery in Egypt. He did this through 10 plagues and especially on the Passover, Passover when the blood of the lamb was to be on the doorpost. You remember that story. In the New Testament, the focus shifts to Christ. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Then we hear in Titus 2.14, Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people who are his very own, eager to do what is good. Peter is using the same word here. You were redeemed. It means to purchase someone's freedom by paying a ransom, a payment. To purchase one's freedom to pay or by paying a ransom. To be repossessed is a good explanation. It is regaining possession by paying the price. Or even more important, it is to place one person from one sphere to another. To take a person from one area to another. And it's important that uh, freedom that uh, Peter is talking about. He says, your freedom was paid for. It was used of purchasing freedom to a slave, a prisoner, a hostage held by an enemy. In the ancient world, by the way, slaves obtained freedom with a sum of money paid by someone else or by themselves. So it was special meaning. Uh, it had a special meaning for people who lived in the Roman Empire. At that time, historians say there were 60 millions of slaves. So for the slave to become free, he had to collect a lot of money. And usually money was uh, measured by gold and silver. To be free from, from the slavery to Roman soldiers and system and to become a free person uh, as a slave, he needed to pay or ask somebody to pay for him. So historians are saying that 60 millions of slaves, many of these slaves became Christians. And as Christians, they were able to, some of them, to purchase their own freedom. Redemption was a very big deal those days. As Christians, we must never forget the slavery to sin from which Christ redeemed us. God, through Moses, urged Israel never forget that they have been redeemed from the bondage of Egypt. We hear again and again, you are bought with a price. Turn with me, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 10. If you have your Bibles, uh, let's use them here. 1 Corinthians, I wanted to uh, give you this passage to remind you. Uh, it's a very important passage. Youth, please, I would like you to read carefully this passage. For all of us, it's important. Verse 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body, your physical body, is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? And listen to verse 20. For you have been bought with a price. That's the same concept here. You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Your body is not yours. It was bought by God. And that's why he says you glorify God in your body. So in our text, we're told that we are freed from Futile ways. This is another way of saying that God redeemed us from. So remember we talked about God saved us from wrath of God, from sin, from devil, from death, from ourselves. 
this passage, Peter is choosing this wording. This is very important. From futile ways. This is another way uh, to say that our life was empty or we inherited an empty way of life. It describes a lifestyle or pattern of life this is, that is without meaning and purpose, unfruitful and useless, incapable of producing any useful result. It is vain, pointless, fruitless, ineffective. Peter describes this life in chapter 4. Open with me, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, since Christ has suffered, the same, the same letter, 1 Peter chapter 4, arm yourselves also with the same purpose because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lusts of men but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all of this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. You see how this life that is inherited by every single human being from his or her forefathers is empty life. It is without purpose, without goal, without use, any use. It's ineffective, pointless, fruitless, useless, purposeless. So when people says, Peter, when he says from empty ways, inherited from your father, he is emphasizing another doctrine of human depravity. It is clearly taught in the scripture and often called by theologians total depravity. It's basically showing, this text is showing us that everything that we are, all features of our personality are corrupted by sin and curved in into ourselves. Instead of loving God, we love ourselves. Instead of thinking of God, we think about ourselves. Instead of having emotions and our feelings of joy about God, we are sometimes having joy in things that are uh, contrary to God's nature. And the will of God, it is used. We, instead of doing God's work here in life, we do our own. Basically, our identity is in things, in work, in money, in gold, in silver, family, ministry. He says, God has redeemed you from the empty life. A life that is used not for God, but to self or for selves. And here we need to understand. Peter is saying we basically... Don't become sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. We inherited the sinful nature that is unable, basically two words sinful, of sinful nature. Unable to sell, to, to save himself or herself and unwilling. It is our diagnosis, it is our condition. Uh, P uh, Paul is in, in his letter to Ephesians, he says, we were children of wrath. We were slaves to our own imaginations and lusts. We were self-sufficient. So this is what God is saying to us through Peter today. He says, conduct yourself in holy life with fear of the Lord because you know what he saved you from. He saved you from life of self-centered and self-sufficient approach. He saved you from futile or fu futile uh, thoughts and, and empty uh, life uh, that you inherited from your parents. And this is why he's saying this. He says, don't go there. Don't go back into this empty life that the center of which is me, me. I read recently one guy said about himself in his avatar. He said, me, myself, and I. Instead of just saying his name, he says, me, myself, and I. 
It's a wicked trinity. Just me, myself, and I. And I don't care about anything else and anybody else. And Peter is saying, God has redeemed you from that. Why he was saying this futile way that we inherited from our parents, from grandparents, grand-grand-grandparents, from Adam. We could not sell, save ourselves. We could do anything to save ourselves. We are not just were sinking and, and crying for help. We were, we were down there on the bottom of the sea. We could do anything to save ourselves. And, and the scripture is saying we were dead. What Peter is doing, he wants us to realize, for me to become alive, I could not do anything. It's not my faith. It's not my repentance that saved me. It is Christ who dives into, on the bottom of the sea and takes me, that spiritual person, gets me on the shore and gives me life. That's a miracle. That's a miracle of redemption that he wants us to realize by this question. So we were ransomed, redeemed from this way of life. And that's why um, uh, Peter is moving to the next, uh, next question. And he is basically showing us the answer to the second question. How are believers in Christ redeemed? How believers in Christ are redeemed? If you ask the question... This question, some people would say different things. How we are saved? I was talking to her recently to a young lady and was asking her about how she was saved. It was interesting that she, throughout the, the whole uh, conversation with me, she was saying that I'm saved by my love for God. And when I asked her, can you love him to the fullest? Like every single second, she said, yes. It was, it was amazing to hear how this person is uh, filled with all kinds of understanding of her condition. And there are people who say, I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how to, how to be saved. We'll see later. Some Christians say, you have to be humble. You cannot be so sure how you are saved. You will see it later on and God will show Others would say, by my good works. Others would say, by my faith or by my righteousness or by my love for God and others. By my piety or my good godliness or my religion or my beliefs or by my, my church. Uh, you know, among Christians, I would like to, that you would see this, this very, uh, very dangerous uh, formulas, uh, doctrinal formulas that living inside of our head and our hearts. Among Christians, these Various views of, on salvation. Look at this list. Now, all religions of the world and all religious people and those who don't go to church, they think that I'm saved by works. Salvation equals works. You do good things, God will consider that. Yeah, they're not perfect, but he'll consider that. We will get you to heaven. This is not a religion uh, of the Bible. Some people say salvation equals faith minus works. I would say uh, it, is, it is very dangerous teaching. It is a hyper-Calvinism. Salvation equals faith minus works. N you don't need to do anything. Just believe. And this is not correct, uh, also not correct doctrinal teaching. It's not in the Bible. The Bible speaks of the faith and works. Some people say salvation equals faith plus works, which means, uh, don't, don't get confused here, it's very dangerous also teaching because it says you are saved by faith and by works. Arminianism, uh, if, you, if you care about that word at all. So, which it teaches you need to believe and to do works in order to be saved. What the Bible is teaching us that faith equals salvation that produces works. Faith. You believe, you receive salvation, and when you receive salvation, you will produce works. 
it's, it's very simple. I think it's important for us to clarify these things. Because we have sometimes a vinaigrette, you know, theological vinaigrette, okay? Um, we're not supposed to be that. We have, we're supposed to know clearly what the Bible is teaching. So how are we redeemed? Another way to answer the question, how are we redeemed, is given by reformers. We probably have heard about this many times, but I would like to remind you this. And those are very biblical, clear uh, teachings of the scripture. Uh, we are saved by faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone, with the word of God alone in our hearts, with, for God's glory alone. You remember those sola scriptura, only scripture, sola fide, only faith, sola scriptus, uh, Christus, uh, it is only in Christ, sola gratia, only by grace, sola de gloria, only for his glory. So that's another way to answer. But why I gave you this? Because we need to go again back to our passage and we will see the passage is teaching us very clearly how we are saved. Look at this with me. First Peter 1.17, we read uh, actually from 1.18. When he says, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your father fathers, look at this. Not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. You see that? By or with? With the precious blood of Christ. And he goes on to talk about Christ and his death and his resurrection and so on. It's very interesting what Peter is doing. He is showing again the beauty of Christ. He is showing again to every single believer that Christ is better. To follow in your own lusts will not bring you any lasting satisfaction. But when you follow Christ and you follow him because he owns you, he bought you out. Now he goes on and showing who Christ is. And I think it would be very important. He says, by the precious blood of Christ, he is our redeemer. He is our lamb. He is our substitutionary sacrifice. Where do we get this idea of the lamb? Think about this with me just a little bit. Think, why we, where do we get this idea? Why lamb? Some people may be first time opening the Bible today, they hear lamb. Who cares about lamb? Well, biblically, it's very important. The doctrine of sacrifice begins in Genesis 3. Remember Genesis 3? After the sin, Adam and Eve covered themselves with leaves. Fig leaves. God it says in, uh, in chapter 3, God gave them and uh, prepared these garments made of skin. That's the first hint. Somebody was killed for you to live. When we read that passage, it's very important. It's a first hint, biblical doctrine of sacrifice. Somebody had to die already for you to wear this clothes. So God clothed them with garments of skin. Then in Genesis 22, uh, Abraham is told to sacrifice Isaac, the son he loved. On the way to the Mount Moriah, Isaac asked the question, Father, Father, Papa, where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? So Isaac already knew that in order to go and bring sacrifice, you have to have a lamb. And Abraham says Yahweh, Yahweh will provide, son. Yahweh will provide. Later we know a lamb died for Isaac. In Exodus, we read of 10 plagues that God did in Egypt to save his people. He commanded to slay a Passover lamb for each Jewish household. The Lord did not check who is inside the house was worthy or no. He checked for the blood on the doorposts. And if the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, the angel of death was passing by. Then we hear John the Baptist. John the Baptist points to Jesus and said, Behold the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And in Revelation 5, we hear in heaven, the redeemed and the angels sing, Worthy is the lamb. So this idea of lamb was 
it, it is very biblical. In fact, it's probably the red line that goes through the whole scripture. God wants us to understand that. Here in 1 Peter, we are reminded of the how. Not by gold, but by Christ, the Lamb of God. But by Christ, by His blood. I wanted to go with you back with the text and to see and understand what kind of Lamb of God it is. Look with me at this passage. I hope we'll see this. Um, yes, look at this uh, highlighted words. I decided to highlight it for all of us to understand. We find in this passage at least 10 characteristics of Christ. And it's not an accident. In fact, many people today, liberal theologians, they say, oh, P Peter could not be such a deep theologian. He is talking so much and so deep about Christ. Just a fisherman, he's probably not the author of this passage. But look, when we look at the passage, it's so simple. We see the beauty of Christ there. And I wanted to give you this 10 characteristics of the Lamb of God because this is how and who we are redeemed from the lust and sinful nature and everything that is following because of that. So first of all, look at this. No, no, let's, let's go back to the text. First of all, he says, knowing that you were ransomed, we're going to look at this. Then see the word precious. Precious blood of Christ. Blood itself speaks about the nature of Christ. He is precious. Then we see without blemish or spot. Then we see in verse 20, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Then we see he was made manifest. Then we see in 21st verse, who raised him, he was raised from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. It just beautiful picture of Christ and this is given for us because we are weak and we need to feed our faith of the truth of who Christ is you know I'm married for 29 years and it's unbelievable for me to realize like with every year I learn more and more new things about my wife and she's just mere person she is a simple person, yet as far as a person, I can learn so much about her. Now, this is just a shadow. Our relationship with our wives and husbands and children and, and friends, just a little mere shadow of how relationship with Christ becomes dear when we learn, when we look at Him, when we talk to Him, when we love Him, when we, when we believe in Him, when we learn, when we study His personality when we study his work that he has done for us we start to notice that and I think you understand how how important it is Peter is building relationships of every believer with their Savior your relationship with Christ will be superficial and very poor if you are not learning of who Christ is and when we see that he is precious even more precious than gold and silver means he is honored, he is valued, he is of high price, he is very expensive, most expensive, you can only imagine. He is dear, he is desirable, he is of good reputation, dignity and respect, he is glorious Christ, he is perfect in all respect, in all aspects of life, in all characteristics of his person, work, death and life. When you look at Christ at any point of his life, he is beautiful. He is wonderful. He is glorious. If you look carefully, everything he said and did, it was contrary to what people would do. Yet his answer, his reaction, his teaching, his dying on the cross, his coming out of the grave is, is not explained by human mind. Christ is eternally beautiful. In our uh, life with him in eternity, we will find more and more things about Christ we will be always he is infinitely beautiful you can be with a person sometimes for 5 15 minutes and you are tired of that person and of yourself 
being with that person. Or maybe that person is tired of you too. And you just want to cave in. And it's different thing with Christ. And what Peter is saying, Christ is precious. He is precious. He is, he is much more in value than anything that you may possess. He is precious. Meaning he is unique. Why he is precious? Because he is holy. He is precious in God's eyes. He is eternally precious. Because everything he has done in total commitment, absolute perfect commitment to his father. And Peter is saying this precious Christ died for you who are less than just, you cannot say that we are precious. We are ungodly. We were ungodly. We were not seeking Christ. We did not love God at all. Yet he finds us precious Christ. And then he talks about this, flawless. Flawless, it means his inner perfection and character. Sometimes we can do good things and they look okay. But when you drill a little bit through, you'll understand your motivation was, was infected with a little bit of selfishness, a little bit of self-aggravating, a little bit of self-sufficiency, a little bit of self. When you look at every good things people do, even externally looking good, you go through the heavenly test of that action and it will be found guilty. Just a little bit of infection will make it filled with flaw. Christ flawless, pertaining to inner perfection. Spotless talks about his external, outward perfection in his actions as we spoke already. And it was from the birth then his childhood, then youth, then when he became a man, every time he spoke, he was spotless. You cannot find any dirt in his character, in his action. If you're a believer, I want to say this, if you're a believer, you will understand it's because of beauty and holiness of Christ. First of all, we understand how, how low we are and how much we need him. It causes our hearts to love him. He is the only one who could die and pay ransom for me. And he did not bring just, you know, millions of angels to die for us with himself. He could do that. He came himself as a flawless and spotless lamb of God. And then he talks about this lamb of God. It's very interesting. He talks about foreknown or chosen. This Lamb of God was not an accident. Christ's death and his burial and resurrection was not plan B or coincidence of historical events. It was not an afterthought of, on God's part. Before time, before the creation happened, Christ, the second person of Trinity, Christ, Christ was chosen to die for the sins of the world. It was always plan A. People say, how about the devil? Yes. He was ordained by God to be. And the fall of man and sin? Yes. And the, all the evil in the world? Yes. Why? People ask, why God allowed sin? Why he did this? He could not, he, he, he would be able not to do it. Yes. But why he, did he do it? To show his glory, to show his power, his wisdom. No one could come up with a plan to save. It was Christ who was foreknown and chosen within the Trinity before the creation. It's just unbelievable what Peter does. He wants us to interact with, with the picture of salvation that is much bigger than our imagination. To show us that love of Christ was foreknown and chosen. He was chosen to do this beautiful salvation for us. And then he talks about manifested. Look at the passage with me. It, he was made manifest. It was not imaginary Christ. It was not illusional Christ. It was not a myth. It was not just a tale. This Christ was real. Uh, he revealed himself, manifested himself, the holiness of God in his birth, his youth, manhood, words, actions. All of life. And then we hear in the text, 
When you go back to the text, we see that he was resurrected. But before he was resurrected, he was dead. And we know how he was dead. He was crucified. And that crucifixion was not there just for us to entertain the thought how God hates sin. There, substitutionary death happened. He died not for his own sins or imperfections. He died for my sins. He died for all of my sins instead of me, instead of you, if you believe in him. So he was crucified. He was dead. He was buried in the tomb. He lived, uh, he, he, he laid there in the tomb, dead, being dead. He laid there in the tomb for three days and then he was resurrection. And his resurrection is God's approval of his perfect, holy, and sufficient sacrifice. Being holy and blameless in all of his life. And then he was glorified. Is if, if you look at the text, it says God made him glorified, gave him glory. That is resurrection and ascension. And he's sitting to the right hand of God, being our intercessor, being our advocate. When you look at this, it's a Christology 101. We can talk for eternity. We can talk uh, a few more years on this one text and see how beautiful Christ is here. But then I would like to point two more things. Because we were redeemed, he is the redeeming Christ. He is buying us out of the kingdom of darkness and brings us to the kingdom of God. And he is divine. He is God's lamb. We did not choose him. And we would not choose him at all if we were given a chance to choose. But God sent his son. These truths about Christ are so much needed for our weak minds and hearts. Because it helps us to understand one thing in all of life. We are safe not because we are holding fast, but because Christ is holding us fast. We are saved not because we could die for our sins or pay somehow. He paid it all. Dear brothers, dear sisters, you might be asking the question, so how it relates to this knowing, you know, living in the fear of God? I probably would like to apply it this way. There are many debates today about what is family. Different things can be said about that, but very important factor. Parents, on a horizontal level, are there in the family to love and protect their kids. To give them sense of value and safety. Do you hear kids? Sometimes when parents say no, they are called by God to stop you. And you have to obey them because God is stopping you by using parents. And those who, those who are maybe a little older, when you hear your father again talking to you, sitting down and talking to you like, look, girl, uh, or my dear son, don't do this. We're going to do this. No, you're not going to do this. I'm not going to let you do this. God is stopping you because parents provide safety and value to their children. But when we experience that, it's very interesting. We start to understand that family is where you are loved. You are loved unconditionally. You are loved consistently. Family is always there for you anywhere you go or anything you do. Family love is what we were made for. We were made to be loved, to be accepted. And the only love that gives you safety and value and sense is belonging to family. That's why many kids, although they go somewhere, they still come back. Because they know they are accepted. I'm 50-something, okay? My dad this year celebrates 90 years old. He's 90 years old, will be in August. It's just unbelievable. I find myself, I want to speak to him. I want to talk to him. And although his memory is decaying and his, he is not maybe capable of saying so much, I know that I can share with him my deepest problems 
because he will not judge me, yet he will help me. He will, he will put on my shoulder his old hand because he loves me. And maybe he will not be able to say things that I would like to hear, but in his, when he is hugging me and when he is praying for me, I hear his love for me. Again, this is just a training wheels. Parenting is just training wheels. On a horizontal level, we teach our kids, this is what it means to be in the family. You are loved. You are protected. You are given what you need. Yes, it's in an imperfect way. But training wheels in what way? It helps us to understand this is what the Heavenly Father does to us. How so? How He does so? How He makes us our children? By killing His Son. When on the cross, Jesus was hanging on the cross, he said, Abba, or Father, God, God, why have you forgotten me? You've forsaken me. That sense deep of being left alone without God was experienced by Christ for our sake. God the Father rejected God the Son on the cross in order to accept us and make us his children. Why Peter is saying this? Why do you think he was talking about gold and silver? That's the following thought you need to hear. He says, look, neither gold, nor money, nor business, nor even friends. No one will die for you. Even parents will not be able to die for you. They love you, but they will not be able to die for you. Yet there is one who did it. I died for you. I gave my life for you. And I want you to understand, you are loved. You are not only forgiven, but you are accepted and you are safe in God's arms. This is sweet gospel that we need to hear again and again. And even something bad in our minds happened to us, or some tension or this or that happens to us, it's not because He stopped loving you. His love does not depend on you. That's the gospel. Good news. Our relationship with God, they depend on His love for us. And that's why Peter is bringing Christ and talking about His foreign knowledge, talking about His preciousness, talking about His holiness, His flawlessness, His blameless character. He talks about His life and then His death and His resurrection to impress on our minds there is no better God to serve than Him. And if you have not experienced that, you need to run to him because Christ says, come to me. Come to me not when you are a little better. Come to me as you are. I know what to do with your sin. I know what to do with your addictions. I know what to do with your character. I know what to do with your life because I have given you it, that life. So I beg you, those who don't know Christ, youth, children, don't wait till you become something better. Come to him as you are. Come to me. He says, come to me and I will never reject you. That's why Peter is saying, you need to conduct yourself in the fear of God and do the best in your life. Why? Knowing that he has died for you. He paid the price for you. And he loves you. And nowhere else you will find that safety but only in his arms. Knowing that all your sins are taken care of forever. <laughs> this, this is unbelievable, beautiful, good news. I'm willing to preach till the evening today. I, I see you. some of you uh, probably want to go home. But yes, we will go with this. I want to ask you the question, where do you find your worth? Where do you find your safety, your meaning? You know, there is a joy when I realize God knows everything about me, yet he loves me. Think about this. He knows everything. If you are his child, he knows everything about you. Not only good things that you put on Instagram. He knows everything that in between those pictures, he knows everything that down deep in your heart. So... Number three, and this is why he is finishing that. Why are we redeemed? Why we are redeemed? The very last phrase, look at this. This is just so good. 
He says, all of this happened. All of this happened. Look, okay, Christ died for me on the cross. All right. No, he says, so that. Look at this. So that. So that. That's the reason. That's the purpose. Christ did not die for us to live the way we want to. Christ did not die for us to live a little bit for him, a little bit for, for self. Not at all. He says, so that your faith and hope are in God. Like every single word here is so important. He says, your faith, your faith. Not papas, not mamas, not parents, not pastors. It is your faith. It is only when you have personal relationship. Then he says, your faith. And faith is not only just, this is very important. Faith is not only knowing about Christ. It is knowing Him. Faith often uh, presented in, in the scripture as tasting Christ, drinking Christ, knowing Christ, living, loving Him, trusting yourself into Him. Trusting fully, not just a little bit of your life. Trusting Him. That's the faith. And then he says, so that your faith and hope are. You know why it is important, are? Because it is currently active. Many people say, oh, I repented. Billy Graham came. There was a crusade. I nailed. I prayed. I cried. Good. So what? He is talking about that faith is current. It is current. It is active. Your faith and hope is or are. Your, your hope and faith are in God. Why he is talking about in God? Because we tend, we tend to believe in our goodness. We sometimes quietly believe in our money, in our health, in friends. They will help me. In church, in our activity, we're trying to kind of pay for God's love for me. He says, no. Your faith in Christ, your faith in God today. It is current. It is objective. This faith is personal. It is active. And it is giving us and producing in us that hope and waiting. One day, he will come and finish his work with me. That's why Peter is asking and saying, live in the fear of God because Christ, he has ransomed you so that your faith, your soul, your hope be in God. Not in yourself, not in your achievements, not in the well-being, not in righteousness, your money, your health, your religion. And why it is important I would like to finish with this. The world, the world is saying, be cute and creative. The world is saying, be you and yourself. The world is saying, be rich and, he and healthy. The world is saying, be cool and um, cute. The world is saying anything you want to put there. God is saying, be holy. Be holy. And being holy, as you remember, it is knowing God in such a way that your heart delights in him and your life is an expression of his character in everything and in all you do. May God help us to conduct our life in the fear of God, knowing that we are His, and we are His forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and thank you for this passage. Uh, so much things there, Lord. So much goodness, so much mercy. We can, just in one text, these few verses are such a blessing to our souls, Lord, because they reveal to us how beautiful, how wonderful your grace is, and how serious it is because it changes our lives forever. Lord, I pray that this text would be used by your spirit to continue to change us into the image of Christ for your glory. Amen.